Gaius Cassius Longinus was a quaestor who served under the triumvir Marcus Licinius Crassus when Crassus took up his proconsulship of Syria with plans to invade Parthia. After the disastrous Battle of Cary, which saw his son Publius Licinius Crassus beheaded and his forces nearly annihilated, Marcus Licinius Crassus offered command of his surviving legions to Gaius Cassius Longinus, but according to Plutarch, Cassius very properly declined the offer. After the fall of Crassus, it was Cassius who led a small group of Cary survivors back across the Euphrates River and into the safety of the Roman province of Syria. At Antioch, Cassius was besieged by the armies of the Parthian prince Pacorus for several months. In 51 BC, Pacorus, unable to take Antioch, led his forces away from that large city in order to attack the poorly defended towns and villages. But Cassius shadowed him, harrying and harassing the Parthian army. Finally, near the town of Antigonia, Cassius confronted Pacorus. By faking a retreat, the forces of Cassius lured Pacorus into an ambush, soundly defeating the Parthian forces on October 7 of the 51 BC year. Although the Parthian general Osasis was killed in the battle, Prince Pacorus and the surviving Parthian army fled back across the Euphrates and into Parthian territory. The following year Cassius was relieved of the suffect governorship of Syria by the appointment of Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus as proconsul. Cassius then returned to Rome, where he won election as tribune of the plebs for the 49 BC year. In January of that year, when the conflict between Gaius Julius Caesar and Nius Pompeius Magnus reached its breaking point, rousing Caesar to cross the Rubicon with his army, Gaius Cassius Longinus sided with the Pompeians, even though his brother Quintus Cassius Longinus had sided with Caesar. As Caesar stormed Italy with increasing military force, Cassius fled to Greece, where Pompeius was assembling a massive army. There, Pompeius gave Cassius command of one of his naval fleets, which Cassius used to great effectiveness, attacking and burning several of Caesar's fleets off the Italian coast. However, when Cassius received word of Pompeius Magnus's defeat at Pharsalus, Cassius sailed for Asia, where he meant to ally with King Pharnaces of Pontus, a client king of Pompeius Magnus. But Caesar's forces en route to Egypt overtook Cassius's ship, and Cassius was forced to surrender to Caesar. Caesar then appointed Cassius as legate in the small army that sailed with him to Egypt, and Cassius served under Caesar during the siege of Alexandria and the Battle of the Nile. He then travelled with Caesar into Asia, where he was obliged to do battle at Zella against the same Pharnaces he had intended to be his ally against Caesar. But, when Caesar returned to Italy to amass more troops for the fight against the Pompeian legions in Numidia, Cassius refused to take up arms against his former brothers-in-arms, Marcus Portius Cato, Scipio Metellus, and Titus Labienus. Remaining in Rome, Cassius cultivated a closer friendship with father of the Republic Marcus Tullius Cicero while serving in office for the next two years. Cicero had returned to Italy following Pompeius's defeat at Pharsalus with the hope of forging some type of peaceful relationship between the Senate and Caesar. Because the Parthians feared and respected Cassius's military prowess, considering Cassius superior to Marcus Licinius Crassus, Caesar promised Cassius the governorship of Syria, where he would play an important role sometime the following year in Caesar's upcoming plan to avenge the death of Marcus Licinius Crassus. Until Caesar's Parthian campaign could be organized, Cassius was appointed the office of Praetor Peregrinus, adjudicating disputes between Rome and foreigners. But when Caesar assigned to Cassius's brother-in-law, Marcus Junius Brutus, the more prestigious office of Praetor Urbanus, which adjudicated disputes between Roman citizens, we are told that Cassius was greatly offended. Brutus, the brother of Cassius's wife, Junia Tertia, the woman widely thought to be the illegitimate daughter of Caesar was much younger than Cassius and had already served as Caesar's governor of Cisalpine Gaul. It was clear to Cassius that Caesar did not trust him. Already angry at being passed over for the superior office of Praetor Urbanus, Cassius was among those detractors who began viewing Caesar's increasingly flagrant actions of late 45 and early 44 BC with suspicion. Caesar's golden chair, which had to be carried around to each Senate meeting, Caesar's right to wear kingly garb on all festival days, Caesar's paranoid removal of dissenting voices, all pointed to his aspiration to become king of Rome. 
Caesar had even taken to wearing red shoes like those worn by Rome's first seven kings, and Cassius was among those who saw Caesar's performance at the festival of the Lupercalia as very obviously staged. It would not have gone unnoticed that only a few months earlier, Marcus Antonius, who had been stripped of all public offices, was merely a private citizen. Suddenly, after marrying Fulvia, the politically shrewd caretaker of Publius Clodius's huge clientele of city plebs, Marcus Antonius had journeyed to Narbo to beg Caesar for forgiveness. Not only did Caesar forgive Antony, but the dictator made room for him to become consul the very next year. Caesar had already appointed office holders through the next five years. So who got bumped to make immediate room for Marcus Antonius? And what card did Antonius play in Narbo to score such high offices from the dictator so quickly? Following Caesar's absolution of Antonius, city plebs could be heard shouting Rex when Caesar entered the city. And although the greater numbers within the population had cheered each time Caesar had refused the diadem offered to him by Antonius at the Lupercalia, there had been a small contingent of city plebs who had applauded and encouraged Caesar to accept the diadem. To Gaius Cassius Longinus, something was going on. Caesar and Antonius, who had been on the outs for over a year, were suddenly in perfect accord. How likely was it that Antonius, newly pardoned, would risk offending the dictator again so very soon after being mercifully returned to public office? Seven days after the festival of the Lupercalia, Gaius Cassius Longinus met with his brother-in-law, Marcus Junius Brutus. Beside the fact that his sister, Junia Tertia, was rumored to be the illegitimate daughter of Caesar, Brutus was also the victim of slanderous gossip naming him Caesar's bastard son. The hearsay that Brutus's mother, Servilia Caipiones, fearing she might lose Caesar in her advancing age, had offered to prostitute the same sister to Caesar as her replacement also dogged Brutus. Whether Junia Tertia, whose name meant the third junior, was prostituted to Caesar by her mother, or whether she was Caesar's illegitimate daughter remains a question. But when Caesar allowed Servilia to purchase, at a much discounted price, properties he had confiscated from his exiled enemies, Cicero quipped that Caesar gave Servilia her properties for a Tertia. These may be some of the factors which motivated Marcus Junius Brutus to join Gaius Cassius Longinus in his plot against Caesar. Brutus had known Caesar and was close to him for many years. Caesar had even looked out for Brutus, ordering his protection at the Battle of Pharsalus. After pardoning Brutus for fighting with the Pompeians, Caesar awarded the young man with an administrative posting as governor of Cisalpine Gaul, an office he was too young to land on his own. Yet, though Cassius was considered the moving heart of the plot, we know that Brutus, the descendant of the famous Lucius Junius Brutus, who had ended the reign of Rome's last king and had been named founder of the Republic, became the official head of the plot to assassinate Julius Caesar. But two conspirators was just murder. In order to get away with it, Caesar's death had to be presented as tyrannicide on behalf of Rome's Republic. For that, an official entity embodying Rome's top men needed to be fashioned. Cassius and Brutus did not have to look far to find a willing third conspirator. Pontius Aquila was the tribune of the plebs Caesar had ruthlessly taunted during his Hispanic triumph and then for some time after. Another senator, Pacuvius Labio, joined the conspiracy on March 2nd when he became an active recruiter. Soon the cabal added Gaius Trebonius, who had been part of a plot to kill Caesar during the previous year. Though the names of those conspirers were never revealed to us, it is unlikely that men who wanted to kill Caesar in late 45 BC felt differently in early 44 BC and may have been brought on board by Trebonius. And so, Lucius Tilius Simba, who had continually petitioned Caesar on behalf of his exiled brother, joined the plot along with Minucius Basilus, a disgruntled 45 BC praetor appointed by Caesar, who was given a cash bonus with dismissal in place of the province he'd expected to govern. Two brothers, Publius and Titius Casca, also joined the assassination plot. Publius Servilius Casca, a childhood friend of Caesar's, served as tribune of the plebs for the 44 BC year, even though the office was usually held only by younger men. Casca, we are told, resented Caesar for not appropriately advancing him in alignment with the duration of their friendship. 
On March 7, Caesar's former legate, Decimus Junius Brutus, also joined the assassination plot. Caesar loved Decimus Brutus and had fostered his advancement from a young age during his conquest of Gaul. Decimus Brutus had defeated the Veneti rebellion in Gaul and had also defeated the naval forces of Lucius Domitius Enobarbus during the siege of Massilia. As one of the last members to join the conspiracy, which had grown to approximately sixty men, including those from within the Senate, some of Caesar's officers, soldiers, and even civilians, it's possible Decimus saw such a vast conspiracy against Caesar as a sign the dictator was doomed and decided not to go down with the ship. And so, those approximately sixty men rallied behind Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus, all agreeing that Caesar must die. Now, the next step was to come up with a plan.